Gorthour, Myron, Anatar, or in other words, Sauron. He has gone through many names throughout his life and he has had one hell of a life. So I thought today, why not put all of our videos together that we know, maybe add a couple of bits in the middle and do a proper full story, everything that you need to know about Sauron. Sauron was a very talented Maya, and he existed before the moment of the music of the Ainur. He came to a powerful position under the leadership of the greatest of the Ainur, Malkor. However, this was not a position of light and good. It was a position that went against the thoughts of the one true creator, Eru Iluvatar. He was even given the name of Gorthaur the Cruel for the acts he committed under Malkor's name. This means that despite not being the main Dark Lord himself at the time, he still played an important role within the First Age of Middle-earth. However, there was also a time before the First Age, so I feel that it is worth a quick summary of the beginnings before delving deeper into the First Age itself. So let us start with a look at the Silmarillion and those who served and were corrupted by Malkor. Among those of his servants that have names, the greatest was the spirit of whom the Aldar called Sauron, or Gorthaur the Cruel. In the beginning he was of the Maya of Aule, and he remained mighty in the law of that people. In all deeds of Malkor, then Morgoth upon Arda, in his vast works and in the deceits of his cunning, Sauron had a part, and was only less evil than his master in that for long he served another and not himself. But in after years he rose like a shadow of Morgoth and a ghost of his malice, and walked behind him on the same ruinous path down into the void. So we can see how originally Sauron served under Aule the smith, the valour who was concerned with rock and metals and the works of craft, which explains a lot about his knowledge and ability in forging powerful rings later in the second age. Sauron in these early times went commonly by the name of Myron at least before falling to the ways of Malkor. And when he was Myron, he was considered the greatest smith there was, except solely for Aule himself. Mightily high praise to be given. A big thing that made Myron the being he was came from his beliefs. He held a strong belief in the order of how things should be run, and this meant he also had a great dislike for any chaos. If he had stayed on the path of good, he could have been one of the greatest and an immense help to all things. But no, he chose the path that challenged everything, questioned everything, and not for the good of just progress, but for the purpose of just thinking that he knew better. This is where Malkor began to catch his gaze. He began to admire this valour, and Malkor would very much trust him too. As he was turned, this is where he gained his new name, the name of Gorthaur was placed upon him. Gorthaur the Cruel. So with that background now covered of his earlier years and the being that he is, let us go almost up to the beginning of the First Age and see just what Sauron was up to. Malkor had entered into Middle-earth and had created his great fortress of Angband in the northwestern lands, and this is where Sauron, labelled as a Lieutenant of Malkor, was located. However, when Malkor was captured at the climax of the Battle of the Powers, the Valar searched his fortress, but when they searched this great stronghold, Sauron could not be found. He had escaped and hidden himself away, watching, waiting, planning for the return of his master. While Malkor was trapped and chained, Sauron did continue in his vision though. After the awakening of the elves, Sauron caused problems for those elves that took on the Great March, which is the journey the elves that were known as the Eldar took to travel from their place of awakening being far in the east of Middle-earth all the way to Valinor. Some had made to stop in the Vales of Anduin, but because of Sauron, they would not linger here and so had to continue their journey. Now, we finally reach the First Age itself. The sun and moon have risen for the first time. The second children of Iluvatar have awoke, which led to Morgoth secretly leaving his stronghold of Angband to try and corrupt them to bend to his will. But it was said afterwards among the Aldar that when men awoke in Hildorion 
at the rising of the sun, the spies of Morgoth were watchful, and tidings were soon brought to him. And this seemed to him so great a matter that secretly under shadow he himself departed from Angband, and went forth into Middle-earth, leaving to Sauron the command of the war. There is not really much of note of Sauron's actions early on, but after a few hundred years and the fall of Fingolfin at the hands of Morgoth, Sauron launches an attack in the year 457 of the First Age. His plan is to take Tol Sirion, which is an island in the middle of the Pass of Sirion between the Ered Wethryn and Dorthonion. It would be Orodreth, a lord of the Noldor and a member of the House of Finarfin who would be here at the time of the attack, and he and his people were simply engulfed by fear. Sauron, greatest and most terrible of the servants of Morgoth, who in the Sindarin tongue was named Gorthauer, came against Orodreth, the Warden of the Tower upon Tol Sirion. Sauron was become now a sorcerer of dreadful power, master of shadows and of phantoms, foul in wisdom, cruel in strength, misshaping what he touched, twisting what he wrought, lord of werewolves, his dominion was torment. He took Minas Tirith by assault, for a dark cloud of fear fell upon those that defended it, and Orodreth was driven out and fled to Nargothrond. Then Sauron made it into a watchtower for Morgoth, a stronghold of evil and a menace, and the fair isle of Tol Sirion became accursed, and it was called Tol in Gawahoth, the Isle of Werewolves. No living creature could pass through that veil that Sauron did not espy from the tower where he sat and Morgoth held now the western pass, and his terror filled the fields and woods of Beleriand. Sauron had completed a great task for Morgoth here. They now held a very strong position from the Isle of Werewolves, and Sauron grew ever more powerful alongside of Morgoth. With this added trust, Morgoth gave Sauron an important task next. In the following years after the taking of Tol and Gawhoth, the man Barahir, heir to the house of Beor and father of Beren of the story of Beren and Luthien, would be causing problems. Morgoth ordered Sauron to kill this man and wipe out the nuisance that he had become. Sauron showed his cunning when taking this task, for in the year 460 his soldiers managed to capture one of Barahir's companions, a man named Gorlim, and Sauron played Gorlim. Under the pressure of Sauron's eyes, Gorlim fell for Sauron's lies, for Sauron had promised to free not just him, but also his wife, Eilina, if he would reveal Barahir's location, and Gorlim revealed everything he knew. However, Sauron had no intentions on ever holding up his end of the bargain, as, for one, his wife was already dead, and so Gorlim too was murdered. It is no real surprise that a being such as Sauron would commit an act like this, but it really does show his true nature. And from here, Sauron would waste no time in having his forces sent to Iluin, the clear blue mountain lake in eastern Dorthonion, which is where Barahir and his people had been hiding, and so he had every single one of them slain. This action would cause some problems for Sauron in the future though, and this all came from Beren the son of Barahir, not being with the rest of his people at the time of their deaths. Beren had sworn to avenge his father for what Gorlim had done, and with a stout heart, he immediately found the orcs that had killed his father and made sure none of them were left alive. In fact, it is from this that Beren recovers the Ring of Barahir, being the same ring that gets passed down through the ages, even reaching the finger of Aragorn in the Third Age. Beren would grow a name for himself, and in time he grew too much of a name to be ignored. And so, Morgoth told Sauron to finish the job, kill the rest of the family, kill this Beren. Sauron would send all sorts of his followers to find this man. Orcs, werewolves, fell beasts. But none could find him. Or at least, none could live to reveal that they had. So you may be wondering now, how would Sauron come to find Beren? Well, Beren would in fact bring himself to Sauron, along with Finrod Felagund, the brother of Galadriel, and ten other companions. On an evening of autumn, Felagund and Beren set out from Nargothrond with their ten companions, and they journeyed beside Narok to his source in the Falls of Ivrin. 
Beneath the shadowy mountains they came upon a company of orcs, and slew them all in their camp by night, and they took their gear and their weapons. By the arts of Felagund, their own forms and faces were changed into the likeness of orcs, and thus disguised they came far upon their northward road, and ventured into the western paths, between Eredwethrin and the highlands of Tau Nufuin. But Sauron in his tower was ware of them, and doubt took him, for they went in haste, and stayed not to report their deeds, as was commanded to all the servants of Morgoth that passed that way. Therefore he sent to waylay them, and bring them before him. Thus befell the contest of Sauron and Felagund, which is renowned. For Felagund strove with Sauron in songs of power, and the power of the king was very great. But Sauron had the mastery, as is told in the Lay of Lathian. Now I will not read the entire Lay of Lathian, as it is not entirely relevant to this video, but it tells the tale of Beren and Luthien. But from here, with their orc disguises now stripped, they were thrown into a dungeon. Each companion, one by one, was devoured by a werewolf. Yet, none would give up the meaning of their presence to Sauron. Eventually, every companion was gone, and only Finrod and Beren were the ones remaining. The next to be attacked was Beren. However, when the werewolf went for Beren, Finrod stepped in. Sauron had intended to leave Finrod until the last, as he thought he was one of the great Noldor, and therefore held the secret as to why they were truly there. Finrod used all his power and managed to bring down the beast, but this was to a great sacrifice. Finrod was mortally wounded and would not survive for much time at all. Sauron felt he was close now. Only Beren remained. Sauron had not known the names of all these people, but surely with just one left now, he would break. Another moment happened now that Sauron could not predict. Luthien appeared upon the bridge of Tolingauhof and sang a song. Sauron instantly knew who this woman was. There was no doubt this was the well-known daughter of Melian the Meyer and Thingol, Lord of Doriath. This even made Sauron smile despite his black thoughts, as he knew if he handed her over to Morgoth, he would be well rewarded. However, she was not alone, as she had arrived with Huan, the Hound of Valinor, one of the hunting dogs of the Valar Arome, the Hunter. Therefore, he sent a wolf to the bridge, but Huan slew it silently. Still, Sauron sent others, one by one, and one by one, Huan took them by the throat and slew them. Then Sauron sent Draugluin, a dread beast, old and evil lord and sire of the werewolves of Angband. His might was great, and the battle of Huan and Draugluin was long and fierce. Yet at length Draugluin escaped and fleeing back into the tower, he died before Sauron's feet. And as he died, he told his master, Huan is there. Now Sauron knew well, as did all in that land, the fate that was decreed for the Hound of Valinor, and it came into his thought that he himself would accomplish it. Therefore, he took upon himself the form of a werewolf, and made himself the mightiest that had yet walked the world and he came forth to win the passage of the bridge. Sauron, having lost his greatest werewolf, Draugluin, took werewolf form himself and arrived on the bridge. The terror that fills even Huan from the appearance of Sauron was so great that even the great hound recoiled. Not just this, but his aura caused weakness to Luthien as well. However, she drew up what power she could muster, and using her magic, caused fatigue and blindness to affect Sauron. Sauron and Huan fought. It was a bloody, vicious and long battle, but Sauron could not come out on top. Sauron knew he had to think smarter here, as he became caught in Huan's jaw and he could not break free. He tried changing his form to that of a giant serpent instead, but still he remained stuck. So now he took on his truer form, no longer one of a beast. But no wizardry nor spell, neither fang nor venom, nor devil's art nor beast strength could overthrow Huan without forsaking his body utterly. Ere his foul spirit left its dark house, Luthien came to him, 
ghost be sent quaking back to Morgoth. And she said, There everlastingly thy naked self shall endure the torment of his scorn, pierced by his eyes, unless thou yield to me the mastery of thy tower. Then Sauron yielded himself, and Luthien took the mastery of the isle and all that was there, and Huan released him. And immediately he took the form of a vampire, great as a dark cloud across the moon, and he fled, dripping blood from his throat upon the trees, and came to Taunufuin and dwelt there, filling it with horror. Taunufuin was a forest located in the south of Dorthonion, and while Sauron was here, it was a place filled with darkness, horror, and death. A wounded and embarrassed Sauron meant dreadful things. As for the Isle of Werewolves though, Luthien had thrown down the gates with her power and she released all prisoners that had been chained in the dungeons and the darkness of Sauron. Luthien saved Beren, recovered Finrod's body, and once all prisoners were free, she reduced this Minas Tirith to rubble. The island would be peaceful until Morgoth would retake it after the Neneath Anodiat. Now what did Sauron do for the rest of the First Age? Well, to be honest, not a lot from what we know. We could guess that he remained in Taunufuin for the remaining years until Morgoth's downfall after the War of Wrath. After Thangorodrim was destroyed, he would reappear in his fair form and go back to the Valar repenting his actions. In response though, Aonwe, the herald of Manwe and chief of the Maya, ordered Sauron to return to Valinor itself to receive judgement from the hand of Manwe. Sauron would have no intention on making such a journey. Instead, he would run the other way and go hide in Middle-earth for many, many years. And that is when the First Age would end and the Second Age would begin. As after Malkor's defeat, Sauron changed his form to appear fairer and began to repent the evil that he had committed at Malkor's side, for he had held a great fear at what the wrath of the Valar could be. He was ordered to return to Valinor for judgement, but instead refused to suffer the humiliation of doing so, therefore he fled into Middle-earth and hid himself away as it says in the Silmarillion. Sauron in truth repented, if only out of fear, being dismayed by the fall of Morgoth and the great wrath of the lords of the west, but it was not within the power of Yonwe to pardon those of his own order and he commanded Sauron to return to a man and there receive the judgement of Manwe. Then Sauron was ashamed, and he was unwilling to return in humiliation and to receive from the Valar a sentence, it might be, of long servitude in proof of his good faith, for under Morgoth his power had been great. Therefore, when Ionwe departed, he hid himself in Middle-earth and he fell back into evil, for the bonds that Morgoth had laid upon him were very strong. It then took a few hundred years into the Second Age before Sauron finally mustered the courage to appear from his hiding, and this was only because he started to believe that after all this time the Valar had either forgotten or just lost interest in both Middle-earth and himself. So this is when he thought it was the right time to turn back to his evil ways. There were actually still men based in the south in Harad and the east in Rune that were still influenced by the corruption of Malkor. This meant that Sauron already had people who were willing to follow him from the outset of his new beginning. These would be the ancestors of the people we see later as the Haradrim and the Easterlings during the War of the Ring in the Third Age. This attempt to return did not go unnoticed though. There was a great elf lord called Gil Galat and he sensed this evil and shadow growing once again, and this is told in the Unfinished Tales book in the section of Aldarion and Arendis, the Marina's wife, where it says, Therefore I write this for the eyes of the king of Numenor only. A new shadow arises in the east. It is no tyranny of evil men, as your son believes, but a servant of Morgoth is stirring, and evil things wake again. Each year it gains in strength, for most men are ripe to its purpose. Not far off is the day, I judge, when it will become too great for the Aldar, unaided to withstand. Therefore, whenever I behold a tall ship of the kings of men, my heart is eased. And now I make bold to seek your help. If you have any strength of men to spare, lend it to me, I beg. By the time of around the year 1000 of the Second Age, 
Sauron was starting to become more and more wary and alarmed by the ever-growing power of the Numenorians. This meant that he needed to set up a base, a home, a stronghold. He decided to use the land of Mordor to create this stronghold, and as it says in Appendix B of the Lord of the Rings, it was at this time that he started to build his almighty tower of Barad-dûr, located near to Mount Doom. I do find it quite interesting that despite it being proven that men were the easiest of the races to sway and corrupt to the shadow, he did not focus most of his effort on recruiting them. Instead, he became determined to bring the elves under his influence, and this was down to Sauron considering them to be a far more superior race. However, it took around another 200 years before he started to put these wishes into action. Meaning, around the year 1200 of the Second Age, Sauron revealed himself openly, but this reveal was in one of his disguises. He took on the fair form of Anatar with the title of the Lord of Gifts, just as was revealed in the quote from the Silmarillion at the beginning of this video. Sauron possessed the ability to transform his appearance in many forms, whether these were terrifying forms like that of a werewolf or at the other extreme being able to appear as an incredibly beautiful being. This form of Anatar was without doubt one of his fairest, as in this form he claimed to be a representative from the Valar. Despite this appearance, not everyone was willing to accept him. The Elves of Linden, which included the likes of Elrond and Gil-galad, did not trust him and refused to treat with this Anatar. Despite this refusal though, it is not believed that they saw through his disguise, so even though they could sense something was not quite right about this person, they did not truly know who he was or what his true intentions were. Anatar did have more luck elsewhere, specifically in Eregion, as this was where the Noldoran smiths and Celebrimbor, grandson of Feanor, were based. Feanor was known as the greatest of the Noldor, as his skills in craft, gemsmith, and as a warrior were unmatched by his kin. I'm sure most of you listening have heard of the Silmarill, the legendary gems of immense beauty and might that Morgoth sought so strongly after. Well, Feanor was the creator of these, and Celebrimbor, being his grandson, was held in similar esteem as he was considered the second greatest craftsman in all of Middle-earth's history. The reason that these Noldor elves were keen to learn Anatar's ways of art and magic comes to the forefront in the year 1500 of the Second Age. It was around this time that the Alvin Smiths reached what was considered the height of their skill after being instructed by Sauron. It is said that this group known as the Gwythi Myrde, that included the Celebrimbor, were more skilled than any others at not just this time, but again all histories bar only Feanor himself. It was also around this time that they began the forgings of the Rings of Power, as Anatar claimed to the group that by crafting these rings it would help them preserve their powers while living in Middle-earth. But as we know from the Lord of the Rings, Sauron had his own plans. So after the last of these rings of power were completed around the year 1600, Sauron went about creating his own ring, his master ring, the one ring to rule the more. He created this ring with the intent of controlling all the wearers of those other rings of power. To make this possible, Sauron invested a great deal of his own power into this ring to make sure that it would be more powerful than the rest. He would even use the One Ring to complete the building of his tower of Barad-dûr within Mordor. Although Sauron believed he had gotten away with his plan, it was not quite that simple, for Celebrimbor had also created his own rings in secret. However, these were not created for the purpose of control and corruption, just the preservation of skill and healing. There would be three of these rings, and these three rings would be given to others of power and authority within the Alvin race with the ring known as Naya given to Círdan the Shipwright, the ring known as Vilya given to Gil-galad, the High King of the Noldor, and the ring Nenya given to Galadriel, the Lady of Lorien. This threw a very large spanner into Sauron's plans. The reason this was such a problem for him is that when he had helped with the creation of the other rings of power, Sauron had managed to touch and taint them, giving him the ability to later use his One Ring to attempt to control and hide from them. So having not touched these elven rings, when Sauron first put on his one ring, he revealed his true self and his true intentions to those who wore the other rings that he was unaware of. His betrayal was now known. At this point, these users hid their rings from Sauron, 
refusing to wear and use them again at this point in time. Sauron even went as far to demand these rings were given to him, as without his help and knowledge there would be no way that they could have been created. But of course, the elves refused to do this, and so the war began in the year 1693. If we head back into the section of the Rings of Power and the Third Age in the Silmarillion, then there is a nice section about this point. But the elves were not so likely to be caught. As soon as Sauron set the One Ring upon his finger, they were aware of him, and they knew him, and perceived that he would be the master of them, and of any that they wrought. Then in anger and fear they took off their rings. But he, finding that he was betrayed and the elves were not deceived, was filled with wrath, and he came against them with open war, demanding that all the rings should be delivered to him, since the elven smiths could not have attained to their making without his law and counsel. But the elves fled from him, and the three of their rings they saved and bore them away and hid them. Now these were the three that had last been made, and they possessed the greatest powers. Naya, Nenya, and Vilya they were named the rings of fire and of water and of air, set with ruby and adamant and sapphire, and of all the alvin rings, Sauron most desired to possess them, for those who had them in their keeping could ward off the decays of time and postpone the wariness of the world. But Sauron could not discover them, for they were given into the hands of the wise, who concealed them and never again used them openly while Sauron kept the ruling ring. Therefore, the three remained unsullied for they were forged by Celebrimbor alone, and the hand of Sauron had never touched them, yet they also were subject to the One. From that time war never ceased between Sauron and the Elves. The War of the Elves and Sauron was an extremely bloody conflict that destroyed Eregion and wiped out the vast majority of the lands of Eriador. An example of this butchery was the slaying and torturing of Celebrimbor, where, after being tortured, he was then slain impaled on a spike, and then paraded like a banner at the head of Sauron's army. It was during this period of time that the doors of Moria were sealed shut as well. Despite Sauron not being able to break down the defences of the dwarves, he at least managed to push back the elves to near the Blue Mountains. Also at this time he created the Black Gate of Mordor to prevent any attempts at an ambush at his stronghold. Behind these gates he collected and raised a large scale army of orcs, trolls and evil men. Sauron's confidence grew and grew at this time, his lust and pride increased, he felt like there was no limit to his power. There was only one thing to do, become the master of all things in Middle Earth. This would mean taking down both the elves and the Numenorians. At this time he even named himself the Lord of the Earth. Even with these intentions, he would take on his fair form at times to deceive the eyes of men, but his rule would not be fair. He regained the allegiances of those that had remained faithful to Morgoth from times before. This time became known as the Black Years, also known to the Elves as the Days of Flight. In this time many of the Elves of Middle-earth fled to Linden, then continued over the sea with no intention of returning again. But not all left. Gil-galad was one that remained in Linden, and Sauron was cautious to challenge his power, for he also had an alliance with the Numenorians that Sauron was also wary of. But outside of those lands, Sauron did rule, and he ruled by force. It was also at the time of 1690 that, after a retreat, the Elves founded the realm of Imladris that most of us know instead by the name of Rivendell, and this would become a refuge. The forces of good would not give up the fight though, as in the year 1700 the 11th king of Numenor, Tarministia, would send great reinforcements to Linden. With these united forces of the Numenorians and the Elves, they possessed the power to push Sauron out of the lands of Eriador, finally bringing a moment of peace to the Westlands. It was in fact near Sarn Ford that Sauron was defeated before being pushed back to Tharbat which was a city located in the south of Eriador, where he met his own reinforcements. This ended up being for nothing though, and this was down to a Numenorean admiral called Kiriatu, which means shipmaster in Quenya. This admiral orchestrated a victory by flanking Sauron in the rear, leaving him nowhere to retreat his force to. Sauron did manage to escape himself though, fleeing back to his stronghold in Mordor once again, accompanied by only a very small number of survivors. Despite this defeat, 
Sauron was still satisfied with the amount of damage he had managed to inflict on his enemies' homelands. But again, this would not last, for the Numenorians would go on to establish dominions along the coasts around the Westlands in and around the year 1800. To counter their growing grip on these lands, Sauron continued to grow his own army by dominating the lands to the far south and east. Sauron felt that the elves had failed him by creating their own rings, so altered his original plan. Now, Sauron chose to give the rings of power to others instead. He chose three corrupted lords of Númenor, an Easterling king called Cremor, as well as five other leaders of men, along with giving out another seven to various dwarf lords as well. The Easterling king Cremor would end up being only second to the Witch King as one of the Nazgul, and these Nazgul would come to be from the corruptive powers of the rings given to men, and end up as Sauron's greatest servants in later times. However, the dwarves would not fall to Sauron in the same way, as they proved to be too strong-willed and resisted these effects. But as for the Nazgul, it was the year 2251 when the Nine first made an appearance. Also around this time, Sauron continued to push his allegiance to his old master Malkor as he started to build temples of worship to him. This caused great offence to the Numenorians as they were faithful to those that had opposed Malkor in ages before. Saying that, it was not as simple as all Numenorians being faithful though, as there were also some that had started to fall under Sauron's shadow also proved by that three of the Nazgul came from that group. Perhaps a bit strangely, but after this point there would be a period of time with not much of note happening, as though they were all biding their time, preparing. That is, until the year 3262, when the great forces of Numenor finally launched another attack on Sauron, once again forcing him to flee. This woke Sauron up to the fact that he would not be able to raise an army that could defeat these Numenorians he would need a different plan of attack if he was going to take them down. This led him to surrendering himself to the then King of Numenor, Arpharazon the Golden, who was the 25th and ended up being the last King of Numenor. This period showed Sauron possessed great cunning and desire to do whatever was necessary to achieve his goals. He continued to show his powers of manipulation too next, as over a few years he managed to rise from being a highly dangerous prisoner all the way up to advisor of the king himself. From Appendix B of the Lord of the Rings, Tolkien wrote that after Sauron was taken prisoner to Numenor in 3262, between then and 3310, he managed to seduce the king and corrupted more of the Numenorians. He would even become the High Priest of the Cult of Malkor, converting many of the Numenorians to the worship of Malkor. As well as this, Sauron persuaded them to cut down the white tree that stood in Numenor which is the same white tree that the seeds of the one that we see in the Lord of the Rings came from, and to rub salt into the wounds of those that still rejected him even more, he built one of his temples where that tree had once stood. This is just like the temples I mentioned earlier, but within this temple human sacrifices were performed, but only those who remained faithful to the will of the Valar were chosen as sacrifices. Sauron's corruption of the king would continue to the point that he even persuaded the king to launch an attack against the Valar in Valinor, making them believe that by doing so they would gain the immortality that they were so jealous of the elves for possessing. This is when Eru would step in and have a direct influence on the land of Middle-earth, one of only a handful of times he would ever do so. Eru made the decision to raise a massive wave and sink the island of Númenor, also destroying the Númenorians' great naval fleet. When this happened, Sauron would still be on Numenor, and so was caught up in the sinking of this land. His spirit managed to survive this, and despite being extremely weakened, with the assistance of the power of his One Ring, Sauron managed to flee back to Middle-earth to try and recover. By the year 3320 of the Second Age, Sauron would make his return to Mordor and once again begin to start slowly rebuilding his strength. Sauron lost a great deal of his power and some abilities in his struggle to survive. For example, he no longer had the ability to take on a fair form like he used to fool the likes of Celebrimbor. Things would not completely be how he left them though, as said from the Silmarillion. But his spirit arose and fled back on the dark wind to Middle-earth, seeking a home. There he found that the power of Gil-galad had grown great in the years of his absence, and it would spread now over wide regions of the north and west and had passed beyond the Misty Mountains and the Great River even to the borders of Greenwood the Great, 
and was drawing nigh to the strong places where once he had dwelt secure. Then Sauron withdrew to his fortress in the Black Land and meditated war. After this crippling, Sauron changed his way of ruling. He threw aside any attempts at hiding his true intentions, instead leaning into ruling through terror and by force. So, he started to truly take up the role that his former master once helped. He would not just be left to corrupt all the lands. There were of course Numenorians that had resisted Sauron all along and stayed faithful, and these were also saved from the flooding. The High King Elendil led these men now, and he received his title after he founded the realms of Gondor and Arnor in the lands of Middle-earth. Sauron's hate for these men never wavered, so in the year 3429 he gathered his forces and attacked Gondor. He took Minas Ethel and burned the white tree that grew there. However, he did not manage to kill Elendil's son who dwelt there as well, Isildur. Isildur had managed to escape down the river Anduin to reunite with his father in the north. Elendil's other son and Isildur's brother, Anarion, managed to defend his own city where he dwelt. This one was called Minas Anor, and Minas Anor is the great city that later became known as Minas Tirith in the Third Age. Along with defending this settlement, he also managed to stop Sauron sacking Osgiliath as well. Despite half managing to defend their homes, the forces of good had been shaken, and so in response they formed the Last Alliance, which was the union of the High King Elendil and the Numenorians, with the High King of the Noldor, Gil-galad, and the Elves. Their plan was to attack Sauron in Mordor, but Sauron could predict their plans, so to counter this, Sauron sent a part of his army of orcs of Mordor north to the Misty Mountains in an attempt to ambush them, while also burning the gardens of the Endwives, all to slow down and reduce the strength of the advance of the allies down the Anduin. This is when it is believed the Endwives were wiped out, or lost as Treebeard would claim in the Lord of the Rings. This is not enough to stop the advancing army of the Last Alliance as they still manage to reach Mordor, and this is how it is described in the Silmarillion. There above the valley of Gorgoroth was built his fortress vast and strong, Barad Dor, the Dark Tower, and there was a fiery mountain in that land that the elves named Arodtwin. Indeed, for that reason Sauron had set there his dwelling long before, for he used the fire that dwelled there from the heart of the earth in his sorceries and in his forging, and in the midst of the land of Mordor he had fashioned the ruling ring. There now he brooded in the dark until he had wrought for himself a new ship, and it was terrible, for his fair semblance had departed forever when he was cast into the abyss at the drowning of Numenor. He took up again the great ring and clothed himself in power, and the malice of the Eye of Sauron few even of the great among elves and men could endure. The last alliance managed to defeat Sauron in the Battle of Dagolad in the year 3434 of the Second Age. However, this would not mark the end of Sauron as he managed to stand strong to a siege on Barad-dûr for an impressive seven years, meaning it was not until the year 3441 that Sauron finally left his stronghold and directly entered the battle himself. As true leaders, it was Elendil and Gil-galad that met him when he emerged, and together they took the fight to him. It was an almighty battle, but none would survive. Elendil would be thrown down with his sword breaking beneath him, Gil-galad would die from the heat of Sauron's hand, but not before they both managed to throw down Sauron as well. In the aftermath to this, Isildur stepped up to the fallen body of Sauron and cut the one ring from Sauron's finger, but rather than destroy it, he claimed it for his own. This defeat and the losing of the one ring caused Sauron to lose nearly all of his power at this time and also lose his ability to form a body in the physical world until well into the Third Age. It is at this point that the Second Age ends and the world of Middle-earth enters into its Third Age. Remember everyone, if you find this video helpful, informative or entertaining today, please remember to hit that subscribe button below. By subscribing, you'll never miss out on any of our latest videos and you'll be supporting us to continue creating great content like this. So as the Third Age begins, Sauron, now bodyless and ringless, is hiding away in the Far East and he now has lost control over most of his followers. These groups descended into chaos, fighting amongst themselves or retreating. It took until around the year 1000 of the Third Age for Sauron to regain enough strength to start forming a new physical form. 
Seeing the danger of this return, the Valar from the west dispatched five Maiar to assist Middle-earth's inhabitants in resisting Sauron's resurgence. Although, it may have actually only been Saruman, Radagast and Gandalf going at this time, if the other version of the Blue Wizards coming in the Second Age with Glorfindel instead is in fact the true story, but that doesn't really matter for today. Despite not being in full power, Sauron began to exert his influence again, especially in the East, stirring up the Easterlings to invade neighbouring territories, casting a shadow of evil across the land. Then we get to around 1050, Sauron establishes a stronghold in southern Greenwood where he builds the fortress of Dol Guldur. Initially, many believed this necromancer to be one of the Nazgul rather than Sauron himself. By the year 1300, Sauron's forces were on the rise. The Nazgul established the realm of Angmar and waged war against the kingdoms of Arnor and Gondor. Despite efforts to unite against this threat, Arnor was destroyed and Gondor's royal line was endangered. Sauron was making a good start. By 2060, finally alerted the wise to Sauron's return. Gandalf investigated Dol Guldur in 2063, prompting Sauron to retreat to the east temporarily. This period, known as the Watchful Peace, saw a reduction in Sauron's overt activities as he continued to consolidate power and influence among the Easterlings. And this is pretty much where we get up to what happens with the adventures of Bilbo Baggins. So, in The Hobbit, the Dark Lord suffered a major setback in his search for the One Ring and planned to dominate Middle-earth. He had taken up residence in the south of the forest once known as Greenwood the Great, now known as Mirkwood, and he hid himself in Dol Guldur under the appearance of the Necromancer. Here, he would plan to gain into his possession every lesser ring of power that he could find. He would then locate his One Ring once again, and build an army that was worthy of Mordor. He had sent orcs into Moria, Urukai into Gondor with the help of the fierce warriors of the Easterlings known as the Balkoth, and even captured a dwarven king of Durin's folk, Thrain II. However, by the time that arrow pierced Smaug's chest, Gandalf the Wandering Grey Wizard had snuck into Dol Guldur, discovered that the Necromancer was indeed Sauron, and managed to convince the White Council to attack his fortress, forcing Sauron to flee. Although, I say flee, Sauron had been expecting the attack so you could say this was all part of his plan, and as we know, evil never rests. Okay, so the year was 2941 when Thorin Oakenshield appeared in the Shire, along with Gandalf the Grey and the rest of his company. They took Bilbo Baggins, the Hobbit, with them on the quest of Erebor, and one year later, Bilbo returned to the Shire with a certain little ring in his pocket. And as I said, during that time, Sauron has abandoned his base in Dol Guldur and fled back to Mordor in secret. While it is true that the White Council's actions prompted this retreat, as I said, it was also part of Sauron's plan in the first place to reclaim his former home. And this shows, as prior to his departure, he had already established his influence back in Mordor, leveraging the control of the Nazgul over the region to prepare the land for his eventual comeback. The presence of the Nazgul proved advantageous for Sauron's initial return, as they created diversions by launching attacks on Gondor's forces, thereby diverting the attention of potential observers. However, Sauron did not immediately launch a full-scale attack. It was not until the year 2951 that he even openly declared himself and consolidated his formidable forces within Mordor. During this time, he commenced the reconstruction of his imposing tower. Arador, while dispatching three of his most powerful servants, the Nazgul, to reclaim and reoccupy Dol Guldur itself. Simultaneously, in the regions south of Mordor and Gondor, particularly in the sea haven of Umbar, Sauron managed to forge new alliances. The inhabitants of these lands had become adversaries of Gondor, and through their animosity towards Gondor and the influence of Sauron's other allies, such as the men of Harad, they willingly joined Sauron's cause. Though they may not have possessed the strength that they once had, they presented a potential advantage as Sauron's allies with their great naval forces. However, as we later witnessed, Aragorn and the Dead Men of Dunharrow had something to say about their potential influence. This army. A few years later, in the year 2954, the dormant fire of Mount Doom suddenly roared back to life. Arodruin, the great volcano reawakened in a display of fiery power, 
It was said that the flames had faded when Sauron departed, and upon his return and subsequent surge of his strength, the volcano erupted, serving as a symbol of his true comeback. The eruption compelled the remaining inhabitants of Ithilien to hastily retreat across the Anduin River, seeking refuge and safety from the cataclysmic event. Again, Sauron did not act hastily from that point onward. For the following 50 years, he remained within the confines of Barad-dûr, laying the foundations for his impending war effort. By around the year 3000, the ominous shadow of Mordor was said to have extended its reach beyond its borders. A fair deal of this expansion can be attributed to Saruman the Wizard, who dared to use the Palantir under his possession within Orthanc. In doing so, he fell victim to the power of Sauron, who himself possessed the Ethel Stone. This marked the turning point for Saruman's betrayal of the White Council. Though he did not explicitly side with Sauron, he had, with no doubt, decided to abandon the cause of the forces of good as well. He was in it for himself. After all, it was in the year 2990 that the once great member of the Istari, sent to combat the evil of Sauron, had himself begun to breed orcs, the creatures created by Sauron's master to plunge Middle-earth into darkness. It is also worth mentioning that, while an exact date remains unknown for this, Sauron also managed to exert his influence over another powerful individual through a different palantir, the ruling steward of Gondor, Denethor. Although Denethor's incredible willpower prevented full collapse, the relentless mental and physical strain of standing against the Dark Lord took its toll on the ruler. He may have looked into the Anor Stone at first to gain knowledge when he fell into a moment of desperation over his wife's ill health, but it was a moment that the father of Boromir and Faramir could never truly come back from. From then on, Sauron wielded significant influence over both the mightiest of the Astari to arrive in Middle-earth, and arguably the most formidable realm as well, Gondor. In the year 3009, Gollum, the tormented creature, ventured too deep into Mordor, ultimately falling into the clutches of Sauron. Captured by the Dark Lord, Gollum endures unspeakable torture in an attempt to extract any information he possesses regarding the One Ring. It is also worth noting prior to his capture that Gollum did encounter Shelob, an encounter that Gollum would later exploit to his advantage when he sets the Great Spider against Frodo and Sam. Gollum remains a captive though until his escape in 3017, though the method of his escape is never really confirmed and there are strong beliefs that Sauron actually intentionally released Gollum, recognising his insatiable craving for the One Ring and the potential this could be to lead them all back to it. As we arrive at the year 3018, Sauron commences his offensive campaign. In June of that year, he launches simultaneous attacks on Oskilian and Thranduil's realm. Furthermore, Sauron dispatches messengers to various destinations, including one sent specifically to Dane Ironfoot in the north. This messenger, believed to either be one of the Nazgul or maybe even the mouth of Sauron, implores the dwarven king under the mountain to assist in locating this Baggins, as news had spread among the dwarves of a hobbit connected to their kind. In return for Dane's cooperation, Sauron cunningly promises to return the Dwarven Rings of Power, or at least three of the original seven. And in return for what he asks, all Sauron asks for is his simple, unimportant ring that this hobbit had stolen from him. Dane sees through this deception, recognising that the ring Sauron desires is far from insignificant. Consequently, he rejects this proposal without hesitation. From this point onward, the events of the Lord of the Rings unfold as we know them in the story. No, Frodo. The spirit of Sauron endured. We can now reach June of 3018 and the start of the War of the Ring. The year before this Gollum had been captured and taken to Barad-dûr, where he was tortured and tormented for information about the whereabouts of the One Ring. As, after all, this is what Sauron's motivation comes down to. He wants the One Ring back. If he can regain his most prized possession, he will once again possess the power to rule all of Middle-earth, at least in his own mind. There is no longer a mighty Numenorean army, or anywhere near the number of elves remaining in Middle-earth as there had once been. He believes no one can stop him, if, just if, he can locate where his ring is. Sauron couldn't get all of the information he wished out of Gollum, but he did realise that Gollum's hatred of the one that robbed him would mean he would hunt for him if he could escape. 
So, Sauron had let him go, in the hopes that he could send spies to follow the creature to where he himself wanted to end up. This did not go to plan though, as Aragorn had captured the creature and handed him over to the elves in Mirkwood, ruled by Thranduil. Sauron needed Gollum to escape to carry on his search, so he drew up a plan. On June 20th, 3018, Sauron sent a force from Mordor to attack Oskilia in Gondor. You may wonder though, what does that have to do with Gollum? Well, at the same time, Sauron also sent another force to attack Thranduil. By sending two forces to these two locations at the same time, Sauron could attempt to hide his true intentions, which there were two main ones. He would make it appear as though he just wanted to test the strength of those that remained in these two locations, but really it all came down to a plan of making a way for Gollum to escape from the elves while keeping his grander plan in the shadows, as well as also giving a way for his Nazgul to cross the great river in secret, making them appear as mere captains of his forces, not for what their true purpose was. And this true purpose was to get them hunting for the One Ring. And it worked. Despite Gondor being stronger than he had predicted, his forces still managed to take the eastern side of Oskilia, with the bridge connecting the two halves being destroyed in the battle. The Nazgul managed to cross over and begin their search though, and Gollum was now out in the wild being followed once again too. Gollum proved more aware than maybe he first thought though, as just two months later in August, it says in The Lord of the Rings how all trace of Gollum is lost. It is thought that at about this time, being hunted by both the elves and Sauron's servants, he took refuge in Moria. But when he had at last discovered the way to the West Gate, he could not get out. We now reach September. Gollum is lost. The Nazgul still cannot locate the Shire. Sauron is getting angrier and more impatient at their failures, and he also continues to gather his forces in both Mordor and Minas Morgul. Sauron, still remaining in Mordor, now orders his Nazgul to stop worrying about secrecy, and instead to hasten their search. This means sending the Witch King to Isengard to talk with Saruman the Wizard about what he knows, but he learns nothing new from this. Saruman lied, but it took time before they were fully aware of this. Sauron would shortly after begin to worry more, as in mid-October the Nazgul would be swept away at the ford of Bruinin, and this was after the Witch King had stabbed Frodo upon Weathertop. He had almost had the ring in his grasp, and it got away. Maybe Sauron's thoughts that the elves were not what they once were was wrong. Maybe they were in fact ready to take him down again. Was he underestimating his enemies? A couple more months pass, and still, Sauron remains in Mordor, working his dark wishes from the shadows. As we pass into December, the Witch King alone of the Nazgul returns to his master. The wrath and fear of Sauron then may be guessed, yet if there was any in the world in whom he trusted, it was the Lord of Angmar and if his wrath were lessened by perceiving that his great servant had been defeated by ill chance, and the craft of the wise, rather than by faults of his own, his fear would be the more. Seeing what power was yet in his enemies, and how sharply fortune favoured them at each turn when all seemed lost. Help no doubt was sent out to the other ringwraiths as they made their way back, and they were bidden to remain secret again. It was no doubt at the end of 4018 that Sauron, likely aided by Angmar, bethought him of the winged mounts, and yet withheld them, until things became almost desperate, and he was forced to launch his war in haste. So we can see from this, Sauron still had trust in the Nazgul, or the Witch King more specifically, but he began to feel that his enemies seemed to have an element of luck on their side. Yet still, he would not push on without more knowledge on the whereabouts of the ring, so still, sat in Mordor. It took until March of 3019 for the next big event to happen, and this was when the Hobbit, Peregrine Took, looked into the Palantir of Orthanc and witnessed the Eye of Sauron looking back at him. Sauron was not fully aware, he assumed instantly it would be Saruman, and he could not fully understand exactly what he saw, but what he deduced was that this halfling was a prisoner of Saruman's. Sauron here made a big mistake, 
and this mistake all came from his overconfidence. So you have come back. Why have you neglected to report for so long? I did not answer, he said. Who are you? I still did not answer, but it hurt me horribly, and he pressed me, so I said, A hobbit. Then suddenly he seemed to see me, and he laughed at me. It was cruel. It was like being stabbed with knives. I struggled, but he said, Wait a moment. We shall meet again soon. Tell Saruman that this dainty is not for him. I will send for it at once. Do you understand? Say just that. Then he gloated over me. I felt I was falling to pieces. No, no. I can't see any more. I don't remember anything else. Sauron was so confident that again, he would not leave his fortress himself, instead wanting to just send someone else to collect what he believed to be the halfling with the one ring from the traitor Saruman. If he had just tried to get all of the information out of the halfling, he would have learned so much more about the closer location of the ring, about the failure of Saruman, and just about the general plans of his enemies. But what he saw was that it was now a matter of time before the ring was back, and that was all he needed to know. Sauron would not retain these thoughts for long though, as with those others around him unaware, Aragorn also took the Palantir and revealed himself to Sauron as the heir of Elendil, and as well as this, the wielder of the blade that was broken, Anduril. The fears and doubts once again filled Sauron. What was going on? Had Saruman been defeated? Did this ranger have the One Ring? He had no time to let these events unfold, just in case his worst fears were reality. This meant three assaults would now be launched. One, some of the orcs from Dol Guldur to attack Eastern Rohan. Two, the rest of the orcs from Dol Guldur to attack Lothlorien. And three, the main attack of sending his forces from Mordor, led by the Witch King, to assault on Minas Tirith all of which were done before they were truly ready to do so. And also on a side note, a force of Easterlings to attack Dale and Erebor as well. Now, would Sauron take part in this siege at all though? You guessed it, no. He was back in Mordor once again while his army was defeated at the Pelennor Fields. Despite this loss being a wounding one, he still had enough of a force back in Mordor to launch a second assault that his enemies would stand no chance of defeating them. So he wasn't really feeling anything like defeated yet. Also here on another side note, the attack on Rohan was defeated within a day by the Ents, and this first attack on Lorien is repelled quickly too. One thing Sauron's thoughts were set on though, is that one of his enemies had the One Ring within Minas Tirith, so another attack was all but certain. Sauron's blind rage and the arrogance that he had were played on once again though, this time by Gandalf the White. Gandalf knew Sauron had false beliefs, and so came up with a plan. A clever plan to take the fight to Sauron, keeping his eye fixed upon them and unaware of the true threat against him. The forces of Good marched their army to the Black Gate. Sauron sent every ounce of his force there too. This was it. Sauron would overpower and destroy his enemy and claim his one ring back from whichever corpse it lay with. Sauron was even given one more chance to realise his mistake though, as the Uruk, Shagrat, brought him news of some powerful elvish intruder that infiltrated Kirithungal. Of course, this elvish intruder was none other than this guy, Samwise Gamgee, the Hobbit, not Alvin Warrior. But Sauron did not waver. He was still dead set on the ring being with the forces marching to his doorstep. That is until he was made aware. Frodo Baggins claimed the ring for himself while in the cracks of doom. The fear. The fear and anger. The outrage at realising he had been tricked overwhelmed him. He cared not now for the battle on his doorstep. He ordered the Nazgul to fly straight to the one ring and retrieve it but their fell beasts could not fly quick enough. Gollum had taken the ring himself and fallen into the lava, destroying himself and the ring. And even as he spoke, the earth rocked beneath their feet. Then rising swiftly up, 
far above the towers of the Black Gate, high above the mountains, a vast soaring darkness sprang into the sky, flickering with fire. The earth groaned and quaked. The towers of the teeth swayed, tottered, and fell down. The mighty rampart crumbled. The Black Gate was hurled in ruin, and from far away, now dim, now growing, now mounting to the clouds, there came a drumming rumble, a roar, a long echoing roll of ruinous noise. The realm of Sauron is ended, said Gandalf. The ringbearer has fulfilled his quest. And as the captains gazed south to the land of Mordor, it seemed to them that, black against the pall of cloud, there rose a huge shape of shadow, impenetrable, lightning crowned filling all the sky. Enormous it reared above the world, and stretched out towards them a vast threatening hand, terrible but impotent. For even as it leaned over them, a great wind took it, and it was all blown away, and passed, and then a hush fell. Also to add here, after the defeat of Sauron, he had launched a second attack on Lorien, as well as in Mirkwood and Dale while the battle down south was going on. Lorien would repel the enemy once again, leading then to a third assault just days later. Sauron would end up losing all of these. The power of Lorien was far too great to be defeated unless Sauron himself had gone, which we have learned he had no intention of doing. Mirkwood was defended by Thranduil and his people in a long battle under the trees. And then in the final battle at the foot of the Lonely Mountain, Sauron's Easterlings would initially claim victory, but once the Men of Dale and Dwarves retreated inside, the Easterlings did not have the strength to take the gates of Erebor itself. Withstanding the siege until news of Sauron's loss had reached their ears, this then sent the armies of the Easterlings into panic and to spread back into their homelands in defeat. And so, the War of the Ring came to an end. Sauron was defeated without ever leaving the safety of his land of Mordor. He ruled from afar, but that did not hinder him in his power. The biggest issues for Sauron all came from his arrogance and the false truths he convinced himself of. He had had time to realise what was truly going on, but he believed no one would be foolish enough to challenge him, that he made mistake after mistake after mistake. That is not to say he just sat there doing nothing at all though. Ruling an entire army as he did would have taken work, it's just something that we never would have seen written on the pages or in the film. There is even the example of the instance when he caused fumes to rise from Mordor to hide the sun for his armies, blacking out much of Gondor and Rohan. We also need to remember, at the time that Tolkien did write his stories, it was more of a custom for the leader to be sat back and to orchestrate what was going on, not to get involved themselves. Along with this, we already know from the Siege of Barad-dûr that Sauron only appeared himself at the very end when things looked so bad for him. There is no point in the Lords of the Rings where the battle reaches his doorstep for him then to get involved and by the time things go so wrong at the end, he would not have been able to reach anyone anyway. So he was never really going to appear. Then also, although the Peter Jackson movies have convinced many people that Sauron took the form of a giant fiery eye, this is in fact not the case. Sauron did possess a body throughout the Lord of the Rings. In fact, he had been able to take a physical living body for nearly 2000 years at this point again. However, I feel we can understand why the team made this decision when we round up the answer to this video's question. Sauron spent the entire time in Mordor, within Barad-dûr mainly. He did not come out and intervene directly, yet we know the likes of Gollum saw him, as he only had four fingers on his black hand thanks to a certain Isildur. In terms of a movie, that idea cannot work in the same way as it can in a book. So, to finish off this roundup, let us end today with a quote from Tolkien himself about just how Sauron would have truly looked. Sauron should be thought of as very terrible. The form that he took was that of a man of more than human stature, but not gigantic. In his early incarnation, he was able to veil his power, as Gandalf did and could appear as a commanding figure of great strength of body and supremely royal demeanour and countenance.